hello. Um, I know I did a Facebook Live yesterday, but I thought I would do another one today, and uh, kind of like a part two. I w yesterday I looked at some notions of what do we mean when we use the word God, and we used um, Lacan to kind of like look at the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. And uh, so if you want to watch that, just go back uh, to my last Facebook Live. You can also PayPal me $100. You don't actually need to do that in order to watch the Facebook, but I'll take it anyway. Um, but yes, so I thought I would follow up with a second one. And uh, again, some thoughts on God. This is Saturday night. I'm getting ready to go out and see a friend of mine. He's a comedian. Uh, Elliot Morgan, um, but I thought before I, I disappeared off, it would be fun to do this. We've already got 26 people, oh, 25, we just lost somebody, do. Um, but I'm amazed by these Facebook things, by the way. We have had, I usually get an average of about 2,000 people watch them in the first week. That's ridiculous, that's very, very good. So anyway, I'm glad you're, you're watching these, I hope you're enjoying them. Please say hi via, as this is my hand signal for the internet, via your comments, ask questions, um, tell me where you're watching this from. Um, I'm currently roasting in uh, LA. Uh, I still don't have any air conditioning in my house, uh, but someday I can dream, someday I will have air conditioning. Um, there's Christopher Bridges saying hello. There's Kyle from Oklahoma. Hey, Kyle. Uh, where else are you from? People here checking in with me. Um, let me know. Anybody from outside of America? Uh, anybody from Australia? I'm going to be out there in a few weeks. Um, Tyler, yes, I live in LA. Um, I love it. Yeah, there's a, a, um, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Is it Silas? Silas from Vancouver. Um, you're not going to be able to tell me because you're going to have to type it out again, but hey. Oh, lots of people. Port. I can't even say where that is. Um, uh, who is that? Sorry. Deborah. I'd Port. Quitalam. Quitalam. My goodness. No idea where that is. Could be anywhere in the world. There's South Africa. I have a lot of people watch me and engage me in South Africa. I need to get out there. Um, I've got a really good friend. Uh, Phil Harrison who directed a movie that was half set in Belfast and half set in Cape Town called The Good Man. Uh, you can get it in on Netflix I think and uh, so if you're from South Africa I recommend it. It's a very good movie and it really deals with what it means to be good uh, in our current political climate. Can we be good and how we're all intertwined. In fact I'll just tell you very briefly the idea behind it. This guy who's just got a promotion from his bank goes out in Belfast and is celebrating. He comes out of the pub and steals someone else's taxi. Someone, you know, heals a taxi and they're on the phone and he jumps in, takes it. And the guy gets on the street, gives the person the finger, like, you stole my taxi. And he's laughing. And then the guy gets hit by, hits, gets hit by a car and dies. And this guy feels guilty for what he he did you know he, he only stole a guy's taxi he, he, he wasn't responsible for the guy's death but he feels connected and anyway he starts to um, support this kid who's in South Africa who the person who died used to support and then so half the film is about that and then half the film is in South Africa where actually this kid is growing up and being politicized and asking why the new South, South Africa isn't necessarily better than the old South Africa and um, you know, it's it's the intertwined lives of these two people. So the good man, well worth watching. There's uh, we've got David from Florida, collective a community I know well. We got Toronto, Alabama, Chicago, very good food in Chicago, much better than LA. I gotta say, LA food is terrible. Belfast, Belfast is as good as Chicago, I would say. Um, I know that sounds like a crazy claim, but um, 
go to Belfast and find out. In fact, you should go to Belfast. Come to my festival. I run a festival every year in Belfast with 50 people. So come to Belfast and experience the great food culture that we have. South Bend, Jacksonville, Arizona, New York, Palmdale, uh, Sydney, Australia. Hey, I'm, I'm getting out there soon. Grand Rapids, I like Grand Rapids. Oh, Tyler saying uh, LA food's terrible to eat. I, I haven't had a good experience of LA food. I don't, I, you know, and I've heard they don't have any Michelin star restaurants and, and you know, it's good for like food trucks, fast food, but if you want, you know, a really nice meal, it's not the place to be. Okay, I've done a little bit of small talk. It's probably because I'm having my, a little gin and tonic. So I'm kind of like a little bit less philosophical, but I'm going to get philosophical. Um, you know that's what you get from these Facebook lives. Um, probably I should just be uh, talking nonsense, but I want to I want to kind of like say something that is half intelligible. Um, and so last yesterday, the last Facebook live, we talked about God. And so this Facebook live, we're going to do the same thing. Um, uh, basically, uh, the reason why I want to talk about God is because this word we often think we know what we mean by it and especially people who are outside the religious world have a very simple and singular understanding of what the word God means but actually uh, there is a number of ways that we can understand this word and it's probably good to kind of outline them and I'm going to kind of outline four tonight and uh, I, I wish I could claim that I was able to simplify this the way that I'm going to simplify it. But it was actually John Caputo in his book, The Folly of God, who um, you know said this very clearly, where he outlined four kind of different ways that you can think about God uh, in the Christian tradition. Uh, four different buckets. Now, there's many more, but these four buckets cover a lot of the territory and uh, the first is the idea of God as a being now what that means is God is like us a bigger better different version of ourselves it's God it's, it's like um, in the Simpsons there was an episode where Homer once prayed and I think it might have been the first time he ever prayed he's, he's about to go over a waterfall and he puts his hands together and he says I don't know if you exist, and I don't know if what they say about you is true. Then he looks up and he says, but Superman, if you're there, please help me, right? And that captures this notion of God as a being. God is kind of like Superman. God is like a, a mega amazing version of us. He's super intelligent, you know, knows every language, fluent in them all. Um, God is, is up above looking down um, and, and kind of like values our values but in a much greater way. God is a being. Now this is the first notion of God and it's probably the weakest notion of God in theology but it's the notion that pretty much everybody in the popular world thinks people mean when they say God especially outside the church. Any YouTube arguments that you watch is generally between somebody who is saying God is a being and someone who's saying God is not and that's the argument but I say that's kind of like the most basic notion the second um, can be described as God is hyper being um, and hyper being is a term that kind of helps us understand what some of the mystics talked about when they talked about God where, where, where they said God is not a being like us, like this glass, like these books, whatever. God is not an object in the world. God is hyper being. God is that which is above and beyond all individual beings. And so every time we talk about God as a thing, we are talking about ourselves with, and as Karl Barth says, with a megaphone. God is just ourselves with a megaphone, right? And the mystics understood that. They said, God is never what we say when we say the word God. Um, 
one of the critiques that is often used by new atheists is the idea that if you could imagine a, an encyclopedia of gods uh, with, a, with thousands of gods, all the gods that have been believed in all throughout history, Christians disbelieve in all of the gods in the book except for one. And the atheist just disbelieves in that God as well, right? Um, now, C.S. Lewis had a weird and interesting answer to that, which is the Christian believes in all of them. Like, they all have something to say, but let's put that aside. Um, in the hyper-being notion of, of, of the understanding of God, the Christian is the one who disbelieves even in their own belief in God. They also are atheistic in relation to their own understanding because they keep reminding themselves that the, what they refer to is beyond reference. It has to be denominated, you know, it has to be denamed. Every name you give is denamed. This is, this is why atheism and theism within mystical tradition have always been connected, because you have to be an atheist towards your theism. You live between these two worlds. As I say, look at the last Facebook page for more information or sorry, Facebook Live video for more information about that, but we live between atheism and theism, believing and disbelieving in the conceptions we have of the divine. Um, as an example, Anselm is, is very good on this. Anselm once said, um, God is that than which none greater can be conceived. That was his definition of God and in the proslogion. He said, God is that than which none greater can be conceived. Now, traditionally, people thought he was saying, God is the greatest conceivable being. And, and uh, this means that he was the founder of the ontological argument, whatever, right? But um, Jean-Luc Marion, a philosopher, he, he really drew out how Anselm is not saying God is the greatest conceivable being. God is saying, he, or he is saying that God is greater than conception because i can conceive of something that is amazing right but i can also conceive of something that is beyond conception i can think that there is something beyond my ability to think it right and anselm says that's god right god is not at the ability of where i can think God is kind of in the realm beyond thought. And human beings, and this sounds weird, but as human beings, we don't just think things. We can also conceive that there is something beyond thought. <laughs> we can think that there is something beyond thinking. And Anselm says, this is what we mean by God. So that's God as hyper being. That's the second one. God is a being. God is a hyper being. The third, can anybody guess what the third is? Um, I'll give you a few seconds. Um, you won't have time to type it, to be honest. God is the ground of being. And this is where the existentialists come in. And they say, well, actually, the tradition that Christianity comes from ultimately says that God grinds everything. So you cannot think of God as an object because as soon as you think of God as an object, you have a subject, that's me, thinking of God as an object. Subject, thinking of God as an object, right? Subject and object. But God precedes subject and object. God is not an object. God is that out of which subject and object arise. So as soon as you think of God as an object, you are thinking something less than God. And so for someone like Paul Tillich, you have to embrace the ground of being. You don't think God, or Schleimacher as well, to be honest. You don't think God as a being. You you kind of, in one sense, uh, how would you say it? You just exist. You meld into life. You give yourself to the world. And in doing that, you, you break the subject-object distinction and you encounter God. So God is not something you think, because as soon as you think something, something is the key, something, some object, you think of some object. God precedes objectivity, therefore you're thinking less than God. Hence, Tillich said atheism is closer to God than theism, because, you know, or, than certain forms of theism. Because certain forms of theism make God into an object, 
and that then does an injustice to God. So the Christian has to embrace atheism in order to, as a pathway to God as a grounded being. So that's the third. Hopefully you're enjoying this, I don't know. Give me some hearts if you are. Um, I don't know if it are hearts. Oh yeah, no, thumbs up. Give me thumbs, some thumbs up if this is good. Oh, there's a heart, you can do hearts. That's um, wow, thank you very much, guys. You know, I'm just very insecure. I just like a little bit of love, like anybody. Um, okay, so now we're on number four. What's number four? Number four is God as event. And um, oh, you can stop it now, guys. You're, just, you're gonna encourage me, I'm never gonna leave if you give me too many more, so yeah, thank you. Um, God as event. And, and this means that, <laughs> this means that, um, that God is the name we give to a call um, that calls us to something more than what is. That God calls us, God is the name we give to that which reminds us that the universe is not one dimensional. That, that we don't just lose ourselves in everyday life, but that democracy and freedom and love and righteousness call us to better worlds, to better being, right? So God is the name that is given to that 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 silent voice that tells us that instead of repaying hatred with hatred, violence with violence, a war with war, which is for Simone Weil um, the natural the natural way, you know, she called it gravity, gravity, which is we we repay violence with violence, affliction with affliction, suffering with suffering, war with war. God is the name we give to grace. She calls it grace, gravity and grace. To that which calls us to repay violence with, with peace, with hatred, with love, you know, suffering with beauty. And uh, now, so I've outlined four different notions of God. God is a being, God is hyper being, God is the ground of being, and God is event. Okay, now I'm gonna say one more thing to complicate this four tier structure. So God as a being is in some respects the most problematic notion. That's the notion that a lot of theists and atheists, the greatest theists and the greatest atheists have critiqued. God is a bigger, better version of ourselves, right? That's critiqued. However, we can't help but talk about the highest, the absolute God in terms of being, that's gonna happen. Um, so for someone like Paul Tillich, what we have to remind ourselves is that actually those words are symbolic. And now, symbolic is a difficult term because when people hear symbol, they go, okay, theological language is just symbolic. We're talking about God as a being is just symbolic. But actually Tillich turns around and says, no, 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 it's not just symbolic. If you're gonna use the word just, Use that term in, in relation to the literal. Something is just literal. So for example, if Jesus rose from the dead historically, who cares? That's just literal. Somebody who's dead three days later gets up. If that was on TV on a weekend, you probably would go out to the pub and, and not even think about it, right? You might discuss it for 10 minutes with your friends, but it wouldn't be a big deal. There's no Lazarians walking around, you know. A literal, you hear somebody, oh, somebody in Cape Town was dead, supposedly, and three days later they got up. That's just pub conversation, right? That's just literal. Or you think of a flag. A flag, if it's just literal, it's, it's cloth, it's material, and it's colors. That's all it is, right? So for something to be symbolic, that has a subjective resonance with you. I think it was Meister Eckhart who said, if, if Jesus rose from the dead a hundred times in reality, but never once in my subjectivity, what would it mean to me? If you look at a flag and you see it burn and it's just literal, just material and just colors, it won't do anything to you. But if it's symbolic, it means something. Not whether good or bad, but it means something. 
So in a sense, theological language is, all, is at its best symbolic. It, 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 it reflects something deep, deep within ourselves. It resonates with us. If it was just literal, it would be of minor interest, but it has to have some sort of subjective kind of connection. So in a sense, we often in church will speak of God as up there, God on high. Do we literally mean that God is higher than us, that like literally up there, that Jesus, when he ascended, went into space or whatever, right? No, we don't mean that. But that's symbolic. We usually are referring to one of these three things. If you're not, I think theologically that's called idolatry. That's an idolatry, right? But usually people are referring to one of these three things. Hyperbeing, ground of being, God is event. And interestingly, if you want to add a little bit more to this, God as hyperbeing is the most kind of orthodox one you can take. It's mostly theistic and orthodox. Ground of being is really a bit in between. You could be atheist, theist, it's a little bit, God is ground of being, a bit confusing. And God as event is the most unorthodox and atheistic one of the three, right? But those three, one of those three is probably what you mean. And in my work, I've always said that whichever of these three you kind of fall down on, they're better than being a literalist on the first one, God as a being. As I say, you might, as I say, more, cons more orthodox, you go with this, you know, you're heterodox, you go with this, or you're a little bit like, um, what was that fairy tale where she has the powers and it's just right? You go like, you know, you, you like that ground of being one. And I go like, brilliant. Those three are fantastic. The only thing that we should be critiquing is that God as being falls into forms of idolatry that are problematic. Anyway, there you go. Um, I hope that was of interest. I think this was, uh, it wasn't as good as the last one. You definitely have to listen to my last Facebook Live. But... I wanted, I wanted to outline those four notions. And I hope if you're listening to this, you can go, oh yes, I resonate more with this or this or this. And, 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 and that, that helps clarify something in your own life. Probably doesn't, but I hope it does. Now let's have a look at some of your questions and thoughts. Because um, there's actually a lot of people on, this is great. I need to do this whenever people aren't working. Uh, let's see. Pennsylvania, Texas, South Bend, Jacksonville. Oh, this is great. People from all over the place. Um, oh, Vancouver, Port, that place that I couldn't pronounce is in Vancouver. I do love Canada, I've got to say. Um, let's see. I like, Josh asked me about Alvin Plantinga. That's an interesting question. He's an analytic philosopher who is quite interesting. I do think most analytic philosophy uh, Josh falls into the first one, I'll be honest. And I studied f analytic philosophy, so I'm not saying that as a continental philosopher who hates analytic philosophy. I do think, I think a lot of continental, or sorry, a lot of analytic philosophy reduces God to a being. And I would say people like Plantinga and Swinburne and Walter Storff potentially fall into that. Um, but of course, I'd have to defend why I think that, which would take a long time. Let's see. Um, Adam, you just said one word with a question mark, and that probably made sense when you wrote it because I was in the middle of speaking, but now I'm looking at it, I'm not sure. But I like it, reductionist. Yeah, and if you mean that is the first one reductionist God has been, then yes, I think it's reductionist. Um, if you don't mean that, I'm sorry. Oh, Newcastle, Australia. Wes, I want to get out to Newcastle. I've got a really good friend who runs a second-hand bookstore in Newcastle, Australia, um, and you really should go to it. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. I can remember the name of my friend, Ivy, but um, it's in, in, Australia, in, in Newcastle, and when I'm out there, I'm going to visit, and uh, I would actually like to do an event there as well. So I might meet you, Ben. Uh, sorry, Wes. Um, okay, Ben, here's a question. What was C.S. Lewis's take on the mystic speaking on, on a hyper being? Uh, he never, we never circled back. Yes, we didn't. I, I, I don't know why I even mentioned C.S. Lewis, except that C.S. Lewis, who's from Belfast, he's about, grew up five minutes from where I grew up, five minutes walk. 
he was next door to a really good friend of mine. That's where he, little Lee, where he, where he got the inspiration from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, not many people know that C.S. Lewis was a Belfast man. Uh, we don't, we you know if, if if it was America, we would have like a, a C.S. Lewis theme park in Belfast, but there's nothing like that. Just a blue plaque where he lived. But he was a Belfast man. Um, C.S. Lewis, uh, you know. I respect, I, there's a few arguments of C.S. Lewis which I quite like and I find very interesting and um, I would like to do a C.S. Lewis retreat in Belfast someday where I critically engage with him. Um, but but C.S. Lewis's idea on the, he, I mean, he would probably be closest to the mystics, this guy, idea of God as hyper being. But the difference is C.S. Lewis wants to say that he has this fascinating argument that every mythology every understanding of God is a prefiguring of the real God. So whenever someone says to him, there's lots of Jesus mythologies before Jesus. There's like loads of, there's, you can find virgin births, you can find water turning into wine, you can find all of the stuff that you find in the Bible, you can find versions of it in other mythologies and other stories. So, you know, the argument of course then is, so why do you believe this one when you don't believe the others? And C.S. Lewis's answer is quite clever, uh, where he says, well, of course you would find previous incarnations because this is the truth and the truth manifests itself in mythology. And for him, Christianity was the historicizing of the mythology. It was the making real in history of the mythology which is kind of like the opposite of the mystics. Not opposite in a bad way, but the, the mystics are kind of going that, that the truth is the least important bit. Like the historical reality is this, something happens in history and we don't know what it is, but it impacts us at a deeply subjective level, a cultural level. And C.S. Lewis is kind of saying the other, the other way around. He's saying the mythology and the subjectivity exists and then it becomes real in history. Um, so, you know, if someone wanted to write a, a, um, an, a university paper on that, that would be quite interesting. Um, let's see, Debbie, uh, but your conception is limited, right? Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Are you, if you're referring to, in a sense, the mystics are saying, yes, all conceptions are limited. The very idea of a concept is that it doesn't it doesn't match up to the real. It's kind of like um, building a church is like you know in the aftermath of an experience you build something and what you build is evidence that you've been touched by something, but it doesn't capture something like building a building. Building a church doesn't tell you something. It, it's it's what comes after. So for the mystics. Um, concept and thinking for Anselm is always by definition limited. Uh, now, I, there's, it, it gets, for, for, for others like the, <clears throat> the um, you know, people like Derrida, it becomes more complicated because they say the unknowing is not because God is beyond knowing. Unknowing is part baked into reality. Uh, if you think of quantum mechanics as a version of this, is that in, in Newtonian science, the unknowing is outside of the knowing. The universe in principle can be known, but there is something that cannot be known, which is what grounds the knowing world. So traditionally, we can know stuff, but there's something beyond that we cannot know. In quantum mechanics, the unknowing is bit built into the material world itself. So unknowing is not a limit to your understanding, it's actually part of your understanding. Uh, yeah. So we can do another Facebook Live about that someday. Uh, let's see. Sounds like Eckhart says, Christopher, yeah. Eckhart famously in one of his most famous sermons said, I pray God rid me of God. And that's, that for me is one of the, the most succinct definitions of the mystical tradition. He says, I pray God, so he's praying to God, rid me of God, because every time I say the word God, I say less than God. Meister Eckhart is definitely one of the greatest mystics. Tyler, was Tillich a panentheist in any way? 
um, is our being ground in God's being. A panentheist is someone who believes that everything is in God, but God is not reducible to everything. So everything arises from the divine, but, but the divine is not reducible to everything. And in that sense, Tillich is a form of panentheist. Uh, but panentheism is very metaphysical. It's still talking about kind of a, you know, it's, it's difficult. Like, so Tillich wants to say that be, the ground of being is not reducible to being. So in that sense, he's a panentheist, but only in that sense, only in that sense. He's not saying God is a person who is beyond the world. He's just saying that everything that is, is not reducible to the ground out of which everything arises. Um, and you can be a theist or an atheist and think that. The unconditional, yeah, Adam, yep, that's Tillich, the unconditional. Um, let's see, absolutely. Goldilocks, thank you, Deborah, I appreciate it. I can't believe I couldn't remember Goldilocks. Um, Gilbert, you're saying open versus process theism. Maybe, but you know, if you know me, Gilbert, I don't know if you do, I don't know if you've read me or not, but if you know, I'm kind of a little bit, I'm a little bit critical of both of those. Um, although I've got friends who are both uh, very good friends who are into process theism. So, but I want to reject both of those. Um, but, but no, but yeah, but this is not about me. So, uh, Gilbert, look at me. I'm so narcissistic. I'm trying to make this about me. This is not about me. This is about some ideas. So, uh, open theism, for people who are watching this and interested, is basically a movement that I think broadly took place within evangelicalism. Uh, within, actually, I think, I think some YWAMers, but I could be wrong in that. Uh, the idea that God... The, the, is the future is unknown even to God. There is something fundamentally open about the future. And so in one sense, God is in is open to the future. And it's not that the future is decided and we're just basically playing a game that has already been played. And then process theism, um, uh, you know, it's probably it sounds quite similar in many ways, but process theism is God is unfolding with, the universe so God is changing with the universe itself and growing with the universe um, so they're both positions about God and uh, I, I actually don't know if they would fit neatly into this four tier thing that I've written um, in that I think you could you could fit them in various ones I think that's a way of that's another dimension that you're adding to the whole thing which is an interesting dimension um, Okay, let's see. I'll probably do one more um, and then I'll, I'll let you get on to watching your Netflix or hanging out with your friends or reading a book or going to bed or whatever you're going to do. Let's see. So the last three people are Joe, Becky and Josh. Um, they're not all questions. Okay, Josh is the only one of those three who's asking a question. Let's see. Josh, could you go over how the event ties into the weakness of God? Yeah, that's a biggie. Um, the event, I, okay, 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 I'll try. So the event was the last one I mentioned. God as a, this event, this, this something that happens that calls us to more. So for example, democracy, you can never describe what democracy is. As soon as you describe what it is, you've frozen it, and it's not really democracy. It's less than democracy. There's, there's something in it that calls us to something better. And, uh, you know, this can be in the name of God. God is the name of what calls us always to different, better worlds. Um, and, and John Caputo, who is one of the advocates for this, I would recommend you buy his books. I wrote the foreword to one of his recent books, Hoping Against Hope, says that this can be called the weakness of God. Um, that God is this, not this strong being that kind of controls everything, but God is better understood as this weakness, this weak force in the world that is always breaking open the strength. People who say, this is the way it is. This is with the armies, the people with the guns, the people with the tanks, all of that, that's strength, right? And some people think of God as super strong. So there's an army with all of these tanks and then God has more tanks better tanks, you know, stronger weapons. <laughs> um, but Tillich is like, no, 
I'm sorry, Caputo is like, no, think of God as the weak force that gets into the tanks, that gets behind the people with guns. Love is not strong. Love doesn't, you know, shoot guns. Love is the person who puts a flower into the gun that's being held by the army, you know. Love is this weak force that is paradoxically stronger than the strongest forces. Strong forces you can speak of, you can see them. Strong armies, you can look at them. But weak forces, you can't see them. You can't kill them. You can't get hold of them. And, and, and so for, Tilla, for, sorry, sorry, for Caputo, whenever you talk about the weakness of God, is, when you say, when Paul said, the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of humanity, you know, and the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of humanity. It's, it's this idea that, that, that God is never that which you can grasp, never that which blesses. Never that which blesses the tanks. God is that which ruptures, um, which gets behind forces of power and uh, opens up new possibilities. And it connects again with what I did the other day. So anyway, thank you so much for being part of this. I feel like I wasn't at my best um, because I just last minute thought I wanted to talk to you. But I hope you got something out of it. Um, I'm also doing a book giveaway. I'm giving 25 copies of my Orthodox Heretic audiobook, um, which has uh, music from my friend who's an artist, an electronica ambient artist called Dub, which means black in Irish. And um, so if you go onto my Facebook or Twitter, you'll see how to enter that. And by the way, you've got a very good chance of entering because I wouldn't expect more than a couple of hundred people to enter. So if I'm giving away 25, you've got a good chance. So go up, sign up. It's a, it's a very sneaky way to get you onto my mailing list so that I can email you occasionally and say, I'm gonna be in your city, come and see me. So of course, I'm getting something out of it, but hopefully you're getting something out of it as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a win win. And you can always unsubscribe, I promise. It's very easy, you just unsubscribe. So there's that. Um, I'm gonna be uh, traveling a bit, hopefully, um, I'll meet some of you on the way. I'm gonna be in Austria, I've just booked that today, but um, I don't have any other details. But if you're in Austria, I'm gonna be in Austria in, a, in a, about a month. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and I'm doing my Friendly Fire online course. So if you wanna kinda of like actually hang out with me online and do go deep into critical engagement with my work, sign up to my Friendly Fire course. I'm working very hard to make it good. So it's worth doing. Um, but yeah. Apart from that, it's all good. I'm going to try and click in in the next few days and do another of these Facebook Lives because I really enjoy them um, and uh, hope you do too. Take care. Have a wonderful Saturday night. Um, I'm actually having a gin and tonic that was bought by uh, one of my friends from the last online course I did because some people come to my house and do it live. So thank you for that. And... Uh, um, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Oh, and Debbie, yeah, me and Rob Bell are doing an event in the UK. She's asking when are me and Rob Bell doing something. We're doing an event together in two or three weeks. If you're in the UK, you should definitely come and hang out with us. See you later. Uh...